Welcome, everybody. Great to have you guys here today, whether you're joining us at one of our three Parker Hill campuses or catching up with us online, wherever you are right now. My hope and my prayer is that God would meet you where you are and speak to you very clearly in the next few minutes that we spend together. Today is uh, the continuation of this teaching series called Chasing Carrots. And uh, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about our tendency as human beings to spend our lives looking for meaning and joy and purpose in all the stuff of this world. And we can be like a donkey chasing a carrot on a stick chasing after the happiness that this world dangles out in front of us. And we think that if we just run a little bit faster and try a little bit harder, then we're going to find the soul satisfaction that we have been looking for. But then we get to the end of that journey and we realize that all of the stuff of this world just leaves us empty because the, the incomplete joys of this world can never really satisfy our human hearts. And so during the series, we're talking about what it looks like to stop chasing after all the carrots of this world and chase after the one thing that really will fill our hearts, and that is a relationship with our Creator through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, today I want to talk about something that all of us struggle with, and I know I struggle with this. Today we're talking about chasing the carrot of money and possessions. We're talking about trying to find our joy, trying to find security in all the material stuff of this world. And this is a carrot that millions of Americans struggle with. Uh, Back in the 1980s, the Milton Bradley Company put out a new board game. Uh, It was entitled Mall Madness. And it's as bad as you think. On the back of the box, there was this description. Will you be the first to lose all your money? You're let loose in a shopping mall with $200. Go in and spend it all. When you've spent every cent and your marker moves into the triumphant winning space labeled broke, you win. Like, got to start training up those little consumers very early, don't we? But I thought to myself, this is such an accurate picture of the world in which we live. Because for millions and millions of people today, mall madness is not just a game. It is a way of life. We go through life chasing the carrot of money and possessions, and in the end, we just end up tired and empty and broke. And I think that we live in a world today where it's especially hard to resist this particular carrot. We live in a culture today that tells us in a thousand different ways, a thousand times a day, that meaning and purpose can somehow be found in material things. I mean, this is the underlying message of every advertisement that you see. Every advertisement is an appeal to our emptiness. Every advertisement has this basic message, if you're bored or frustrated or lonely, buy our product because our product will save you from your boredom, frustration, and loneliness. And this is the message that we hear every single day, that we need something more. But then to make matters worse, we live in this world where there's no shortage of things that we can spend our money on, right? I mean, it seems like just when you think you have everything you need, they come out with something new. And living as we do in the age of the internet, we are constantly confronted, even with little pop-up ads, constantly confronted with all the stuff out there that we do not yet have, stuff that we need, stuff like this the baby mop onesie. (laughs) Now, some people say American innovation is dead. Clearly, it is not. This, my friends, this is efficiency. This is efficiency right here. In fact, go back one. Uh, We're still back on the last one. This is efficiency right here. And if you really want to make this better, you you know, you, um, if you're, if you're a mom, you have a play date and you get all the other kids about the same age, and you buy all of them, the Baby Mop onesie, and you spend about an hour together, and you're good to go. Okay, here's another one. Uh, Yes, the Capsule Pet Backpack. Nothing freaky at all about that. So uh, this is like next level. If you want to go somewhere and bring your cat with you, you have got to have the Capsule Pet Backpack. I'll give you one more example. Uh, The Giant Swiss Army Knife. Um, This bad boy has 87 different implements, 87. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that this is a bit uncomfortable to carry in your pocket, but you can get this for $1,400. 
Like we live in this world now where we have access to all kinds of stuff and it's only one click away. And, and to be honest, see, this is my biggest temptation, the whole online shopping thing. Because I have a prime membership to Amazon, which means I get free shipping, which means that I kind of have to buy stuff because you got to use the free shipping. It's kind of like a stewardship thing, right? And, and, and so my family will tell you that three or four times a week there's an Amazon box on our front porch. I, like, I know the UPS guy by his first name. Um, he's coming to our house for Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, we are that close. My point is this. It is easier than ever before in history to fill our lives with material things, thinking that that will make us happy. But ultimately, we just end up disappointed and more deeply in debt and have our lives filled with all kinds of stuff that we don't really need because we're just chasing carrots. And today, as we talk about this, I want to focus your attention on a passage of Scripture in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes was written by a man named Solomon. Uh, Solomon was the king of Israel, and he was a man who was blessed with tremendous, tremendous, incredible wealth. In fact, uh, in, in the pages of Scripture, Solomon is the wealthiest person in the Bible. He's like the Bill Gates of the Bible, but then a lot more. In fact, back in uh, the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 9, there's a summary of Solomon's wealth. Let, let me just pull a few phrases out of there for you. Every year, King Solomon received over 25 tons of gold in addition to the taxes paid by the traders and merchants. He had a fleet of ocean-going ships. Every three years, his fleet would return, bringing gold and silver and ivory. King Solomon also had 4,000 stalls for his chariots and horses and hundreds of people to clean those stalls, I'm sure of it. During his reign, listen to this, silver was as common in Jerusalem as stone. I mean, Solomon was incredibly wealthy. In fact, historians say that if you could convert his wealth into today's dollars, his net worth would be about $2 trillion. Later in life, Solomon writes this book of the Bible that we call Ecclesiastes. And he's looking back on life and he's reflecting on everything that he's experienced. And it's, it's kind of a depressing book to read, to be honest with you. I, I think he was kind of in a midlife crisis when he wrote it. But there's this word that comes up over and again, thir- over and over again, 33 times in 12 chapters. The word is meaningless. And here in chapter 5, Solomon talks about his wealth. He speaks from experience, and and he addresses for us three very common myths about money. So here's, here's the first myth about money, that money will satisfy my heart. That's a myth that money will satisfy my heart. Here's here's how it begins here in verse 10. He says, whoever loves money, and by the way, it doesn't say whoever has money. It says whoever loves money. There's a big difference. You can be poor and love money. You can be rich and love money because it's got nothing to do with what's in your bank account. It's got everything to do with what's in your heart because the problem is not money. The problem is when we make money our God, when we look to money and possessions and material things to fill the emptiness in our hearts that only God can really fill, that's when we're loving money. And here's what Solomon says. He says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. So Solomon, who had greater wealth than anyone in history, had discovered that even that, even his vast wealth did not satisfy the deepest longings of his heart. In in fact, let me give you a more current example, a more recent example. I'm sure you've heard of John D. Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller is uh, commonly understood to be the, the wealthiest American who has ever lived. Uh, He made his money in the oil industry. At one point, he controlled 90% of the American oil industry. It is estimated that in today's dollars, uh, his net worth would be about $400 billion. And somebody asked him a question one day. Somebody said, how much money does it take to make a man happy? And you know the answer, right? How much money does it take? Just a little more. 
more wealth doesn't satisfy. If you're, if you're searching for that, Solomon says, if material things are the focus of your life, if that's where you're trying to find meaning and fulfillment, you will never be satisfied. It's an empty pursuit. It will never completely fill your heart. And here's what we, we know. We know this, right? We know this intellectually, but we forget this. And we get sucked in and we get caught up in the pursuit of material things, driven by something greater than just our need. In fact, there's a pretty common pattern that we follow. You can see this uh, in, in your own life probably. I know I can see it in mine. We start with wanting something. Like you see a TV commercial, you see an advertisement, you see something online and you think, I want that. I, I don't know if my life would be complete without that. And so you want that, and if you want something long enough, then you take the next step and you begin to look for what you want. And you try to find out who has the best price and go online, do your research, you go to the store and you walk around and the clerk says, may I help you? And you say, no, I'm just what? I'm just looking. And we look, and if we look long enough, eventually what we do is we buy. And buying is the fun part, right? That, that's the fun part. When you walk out of the store with that new outfit and that, with that big, big screen TV, when you drive off the lot with that new car, I mean, that feels awesome, doesn't it? Something happens in your heart, and it really feels good. But then the painful part comes next, and that's paying for it. Because this is kind of how we operate as Americans, right? We buy it, and then we figure out how we're going to pay for it. So we, we want, we look, we buy, we pay And then what happens is a couple of months go by and we get bored because the new thing isn't so new anymore. And our hearts begin to want again. And we start this cycle all over of wanting, looking, buying, and paying. And we just keep repeating this cycle. And this is the way we often live. Driven trying to fill by trying to fill the emptiness in our hearts. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting things or buying things as long as you have the the budget for that, the resources for that, as long as you believe that God wants you to purchase and to own that thing. But what research shows is that so many people in our culture are living in this kind of a cycle, and uh, it's becoming for many people a downward spiral. And ultimately, they don't end up happier. They just end up disappointed, more deeply in debt, and with a life that's more cluttered with things they don't really need. And so here's what Solomon says about this whole thing at the end of verse 10. He says, this too is meaningless. The constant pursuit of the next thing that you think will make you happy is meaningless. It will not ultimately satisfy you. So let me ask you to do some soul searching and ask yourself a question. The next time you're ready to spend some money or earn some money and sock it away, you know, the question is this, what is driving you? What is in your heart that is driving you? Because see, Solomon figured us out like 3,000 years ago. He said, listen, if you try to fill the emptiness of your heart with the stuff of this world, you're just not going to be satisfied. You're just going to spend your life chasing carrots. So myth number one, myth number one is this, money will satisfy my heart. Here's myth number two. Myth number two is that money will solve my problems. Now, let me say that it's important to work hard and provide for our families, and certainly there are some problems that money will solve. Like if you know somebody who's hungry, you can solve that problem by using your money to buy them some food. If somebody doesn't have shoes, you can solve that problem by buying them some shoes. We'll actually give you a chance to do that in a few weeks for a Christmas project that we're going to be talking about. So yes, money can solve some problems, but the myth is this. The myth is that money has the power to solve all the problems that we face in life, and a lot of people believe this myth. But Solomon, richest man who ever lived, in these next few verses reminds us that money can't solve all of our problems. And in fact, it actually creates a few problems of its own. Let me pick up in verse 11. He says this, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, as your wealth increases, so does the number of people who want to help you spend it. Is this not true? I mean, years ago when I was young and uh, working 
part-time as an auto mechanic, making $15,000 a year, and didn't have a home of my own. Nobody called me to sell me homeowner's insurance or a better mortgage rate or replacement windows. But now that I own a house, people call me and they send stuff in my mailbox that they want to sell me for all kinds of things related to what I now own. See, it's a simple fact of life that the more that you have, the more people there will be who will help you to spend that. That's a bit of a downside. And then he goes on to say this in in verse 12, the sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. And you're like, I'd like to try that. I'd like to test that theory. Here's what Solomon is saying. He's saying, listen, wealth will not make you happier, and it can sometimes make your life more complicated. Again, I was thinking about this, thinking back uh, to when I was in college. You know, when I was in college, I could fit all of my worldly possessions in my car and still have room for passengers. I could carry my entire net worth in my wallet. I was working my way through college as a part-time auto mechanic. My, my life was simple. Man, I slept very well. But now, now I have a full-time job, a house, a couple of cars, two kids in college, bank accounts, all kinds of material things that I have to store and insure and upgrade and protect. And I've come to realize that the more stuff I have, the more complicated my life gets and the more of a burden it, it can actually become. Uh, my family and I, one of the places we love to uh, vacation, one of the places we love to travel is uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And if you're from around here, you know that there's a large Amish population in, in Lancaster. And uh, whenever you drive around down there, you see them all over the place, uh, driving their buggies alongside the road. You'll, you'll see a, a guy working in the field with a plow, a horse-drawn plow. You'll see a mom out hanging up her family laundry, very monochromatic laundry, uh, just a few different colors, hanging it on the clothesline to drive. And, and you drive by these, these neat little houses that have no power lines going to them because they don't use any electricity off of the grid. Can I be honest with you? Sometimes when I'm in Lancaster and I drive around and I see the Amish folks, I'm a little bit envious. I envy their pace of life. I envy their simplicity. I I envy the time that they have for each other, for relationships. I envy the fact that their lives are not filled with mountains of things to distract them. Solomon says, sometimes, you know, wealth, as good as it can be, it can also be a burden. And then, it, then he goes on to say this. Let me pick up in verse 13. He says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. That first part is so interesting to me, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. That, that phrase is so foreign to our culture, isn't it? I mean, that idea of having so much wealth that you could actually create harm in your own life. You're thinking, is that even possible? Yes, it is. I see it all the time. Like the guy who makes it to the top of his company, but blows up his marriage along the way. Like the kids who grow up believing that they are not valued by their parents because mom and dad are working such crazy schedules that they can't be there. Or like a husband and wife who get themselves deeply in debt trying to support a certain lifestyle. And it creates all kinds of stress and all kinds of arguments. Or like so many people who drift away from their faith, who drift away from God because they are so preoccupied with pursuing the good life the harm, wealth hoarded to the harm of his owners. Now, Solomon is not saying that you ought to be lazy and do everything possible to stay poor. He's not, that's not the point. It's just a reality check. Solomon is simply saying, listen, don't think that having more will somehow solve all your problems. In fact, it will create some problems of its own. So myth number one, myth myth number one, money will satisfy my heart. Not true. Myth number two, money will solve my problems. And here's myth number three, that money will secure my future. And a lot of people 
in our culture look to money for their security. And they think, you know, if I can just pile up enough of this stuff, then I can weather any storm. I can deal with any problem. My life is going to be bulletproof. And what we tend to do is we tend to make money our strong fortress. We tend to find our security in it. We tend to make money our God, our protector. And so Solomon in these next couple of verses just gives us a healthy dose of reality. And he says, listen, when it comes to your eternal future, money can do nothing for you. And that's the future that really matters. Listen to verse 15. He says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart, and what do they gain since they toil for the wind? And again, we all know this, but it's just a good reminder that we start out in life with nothing, and whatever we gain in this brief time on earth, when we leave, it stays. And we leave this world the same way we came into it, naked and broke. Like I've said before, life is kind of like a game of Monopoly. Now, when I, when I was a kid, I loved a good game of Monopoly. And, and to be honest about it, and I say this in all humility, I was very good at it. Um, I loved the thrill of getting the properties and then getting the whole set. And then you build the houses on there. And then you upgrade to the hotels and then other people land on your developed property and they pay that exorbitant rent. And then my siblings would run out of money and they would say, Brother Mark, can I have a loan? And I would say, no way. You either pay up or you surrender your property to me. And eventually, eventually I would, uh, I would own the whole board. Like every square inch of it would be mine. I had conquered it. I had victory. And then... The game is over, and it all goes back in the box. See, I don't want it to go back in the box. I want to leave it out there for everyone to see. In fact, I want to bronze it as a memorial to my victory. But it all goes back in the box. And 10 minutes later, nobody remembers and nobody cares who won the game. I've always thought that's a pretty good picture of life. Because the reality is this, whatever you have, it's going to go back in the box. And you're going to enter eternity. And at that moment, it won't matter what you left on the board. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 8. He said this, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? He said, it doesn't matter how much treasure you pile up here on this earth. What matters is how much treasure you have stored up in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have material possessions or enjoy material possessions or manage them well because if we don't have things, then we can't bless others with our generosity. But it does mean this, that we had better not chase this stuff to the point where we neglect what really matters eternally. We'd better not spend our lives trying to find something to fill the emptiness that only God can really fill. So three myths. Solomon said, here's, here's a little bit, bit of myth busting. Money will satisfy my heart. Money will solve my problems. Money will secure my future. None of that is true. And then, at the end of verse 17, uh, you come to a turning point. Okay, so Solomon has been describing the dangers of, of loving money, of being caught up in materialism and consumerism. And then in these last few verses, Solomon switches gears and he tells us how to step off the treadmill of consumerism, how to, how to break the grip of greed in our lives. And, and it's these two things. Here's two things that we need to do all the time. Pursue contentment and practice gratitude. If we're ever going to stop chasing the carrot of stuff, we've got to pursue contentment and practice gratitude. Verse 18, this, this talks about contentment. He said this, Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink. By the way, this is one of the reasons I love the book of Ecclesiastes. We are actually commanded here to eat and drink. Okay, it's good for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction, contentment, peace in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life. God has given him, take note of the word God, I'll come back to that later. God has given him for this is his lot. This is a poetic way of describing contentment. Solomon is saying, listen, don't get all caught up in the crazy pursuit of more and more and more. 
He says, just work hard at whatever job God has given you. Enjoy your life, eat and drink, love your family, and praise God for the life that you have. It's a picture of contentment. I love the way that John Piper says it in his book, Desiring God. He says, the deepest, most satisfying delights God gives us are free gifts from nature and from loving relationships with people. He says, after your basic needs are met, buying things contributes absolutely nothing to the heart's capacity for joy. Who do you think, he says, who do you think has the deepest, most satisfying joy in life? The man who pays $240 for a 40th floor suite downtown and spends his evening in the half-lit, smoke-filled lounge impressing strange women with $10 cocktails, or the man who chooses the Motel 6 by a vacant lot of sunflowers and spends his evening watching a sunset and writing a letter to his wife. Solomon says, practice contentment. Enjoy the simple, good gifts that God has given to you. Pursue contentment. And then secondly, practice gratitude. Because gratitude, here's the thing, gratitude for what I already have will silence the craving for what I do not yet have. Let me say that again. Gratitude for what I already have will silence the craving for what I do not yet have. Look at verse 19. He goes on, moreover, when God gives, take a note of that, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil. This is a gift of God. So he's saying that whatever we have, whatever you have, whether it is great or small, it is a gift from God. He's given it to you. What is the appropriate response when someone gives you a gift? Gratitude, to say thank you. See, and I believe that one of the best ways to fight the pull of materialism is to live every day in a spirit of, of, of gratitude recognizing that everything we have in our lives is indeed a gift from God. And when your heart is consistently filled with gratitude, it'll begin to drown out the voice of greed. But here's the problem. The problem is that we begin to take all of the blessings of our lives for granted. A few years ago, uh, my kids introduced me to a phrase. It's this phrase, first world problems. Did you ever hear this? Uh, I'll tell you how it came up. I was complaining one day about the fact that the ice maker on our fridge wasn't working and that I would have to drive a mile to the store to buy a bag of ice. And I was complaining about this, and my daughter said, yeah, yeah, Dad, first world problem. You know what first world problems are? A first world problem is something that we would see as a problem, but much of the rest of the world would see as a blessing and be thankful for it. It's just that we take it for granted now. In fact, I did a quick search online on this hashtag, first world problems, just to give you a few more examples like this one. So frustrating to get home from the grocery store and not be able to fit the food in the refrigerator. Yes, that is so frustrating. <laughs> to have so much food that you can't fit it in your refrigerator that you plug into your wall to preserve your food, something in, that most people in human history never would have imagined. So frustrating. Then this one, this one. Uh, it's 74 degrees and sunny. I can't decide whether to use the AC or open the car windows. First world problem there. And this probably is my favorite one right here. Ugh, I hate it when my Apple Watch doesn't register the right distance when I run on the beach. Yeah, that's rough when your Apple Watch doesn't work exactly right when you're on vacation running on the beach. See, sometimes I think we just need to stop and assess how blessed we already are. And that will quell that voice of discontentment in our hearts. In fact, when you leave here today, I want to take you with you a simple four-word phrase. A four-word phrase that I think will be extremely helpful in developing a heart of gratitude. This phrase is not original with me. It comes from an old Peanuts comic strip. It was Thanksgiving, and Snoopy is looking at his food. And he says, how about that? Everyone is eating turkey today, but just because I'm a dog, I get dog food. Then he says, of course, it might have been worse. I could have been born a turkey, okay? So from that comic strip, I wanna give you a four-word phrase. This is the four-word phrase for this week. It could be worse. It could be worse. 
In fact, I want us to say it together so that we tattoo it onto our brains, okay? We're going to say it like this. It could be worse. Here we go. One, two, three. It could be worse with conviction. Let's say it again. Here we go. It could be worse. Okay, here's how you're going to use that. You're going to leave here today, and you're going to walk out to the parking lot, and you're going to get into some kind of vehicle. And you're going to look around at other vehicles, and you may think to yourself, You know, I just wish I had a car that was a little bit nicer, a little bit newer, a little bit lower mileage, a little bit shinier, because if I had a car like that, then I could be happy. But you're not going to do that today. Today, you're going to get in your car, and let's all say it together. You're going to say this, it could be worse. That's right, okay? And So so then you're going to get home to wherever you live, and you're going to walk through the door of your home your apartment, your house, whatever it might be. And you might be tempted to look around and think, you know what, I, I, I would be happy if I just had a little bit newer home, a little bit nicer home, you know, nine-foot ceilings, granite countertops. If I had that, then, then I'd be happy. You're not going to say that today. You're going to walk into that house where you live, and here's what you're going to say. You're going to say it out loud with conviction. Here we go. It could be worse. That's right. This is how that works. And then tomorrow morning... When you're eating breakfast, sitting across the table from your spouse, you're going to look at him or her and you're going to say, no, we're not, we won't do that one, okay? Here's my point. One of the best things we can do is to stop and take inventory of our lives and to recognize how blessed we already are and to find contentment and to give thanks because when your heart is filled with gratitude, then the voice of greed will grow silent. In fact, Earlier in the service, you heard about some trips that we're going to be taking next summer to Kenya and Haiti. I think one of the best things you can do is to get outside of your own comfort zone, become one par- part of one of those global outreach teams, and experience life in another part of the world that will make you realize how blessed we really are in some ways, but how poor we are in other ways when you see their joy and their contentment and their deep faith, okay? So two things we need to do if we're gonna stop chasing this carrot. Number one, we gotta pursue contentment. Number two, practice gratitude. And, and let me make one last observation about this passage. I hope you caught this. If you didn't, you can go back and reread it later on. But in verses 10 through 17, no mention of God. Verses 18 and 19, God is mentioned three times. And I point that out because I believe the reason why so many people are filling their lives with more and more stuff is that we have an emptiness inside that just won't go away. And the emptiness that many people feel is a spiritual emptiness, but we try to fill it with material things. And I think most of the consumerism, most of the materialism of our culture is just an attempt to deal with the pain of an empty heart. And instead, what we need to do is fill our hearts with the one thing that will truly satisfy. We're going to end our service today with, with one more song, so don't go anywhere. And it's a, it's a powerful song, a very appropriate song. It's entitled, Who You Say I Am. It speaks of our identity as God's children. And do you know what we do so often? We try to find our identity in what we own or what we have in our bank account. We cling to the stuff of this world. We pursue the stuff of this world because we think that is what will give us value and give us joy and give us security. But it's so fleeting, it is so temporary. Let me end with one last scripture verse, Hebrews 13, 5. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Here's why. Because God has said, never will I leave you And never will I forsake you. See, the world tells us that we're going to find satisfaction in all the pretty things of this world, but God says that we're going to find it in him alone. And when your deepest needs are being met in an authentic relationship with your heavenly Father, then all the stuff of this world is no longer so attractive. Watch this with me as the band sets up.